Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Singer. I am the Senior Director Event Programming at Media Post, and this is Brand Insider BTS, where I get to interview some of the most influential brand women marketers out there. And with me today is Sharon Price John. She is the president and CEO of Build a Bear Workshop. Hey Sharon, Hi. welcome. Hi, thanks. So happy to be here. I'm so happy for you to be here. And also I love your little bears in the background. So this is awesome. And I have to say, I have, like I started reading your book, which I'm gonna talk about, you know, for you guys to know, for you to know, but um, you're who I, I aspire to be, like seriously, like you just are doing it all. You are, um, you know, CEO of a major corporation. Um, you also are the author, which I just mentioned. Um, your book is Stories and Heart, and it came out earlier this year. You're also an executive producer. I know you partnered with Reese Witherspoon's um, production company, and but not only that, um, you have done Hallmark movies, which I have to say, I am such a Hallmark girl. I've been the original Hallmark girl. So when I saw that, I was so excited. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, if you even watch some of my earlier, I always bring it up. That's just what I love to do. But just all of that around. I mean, where do you, so there's many, just being the CEO of Build-A-Bear would be, okay, that's great, let's keep it there. But you just keep doing all of these other things. What drives you? Well, oh, wow, we're just right out of the gate. <laughs> <laughs> we are, because I'm sorry, as soon as I read about you, and I was just like, every second, I, I seriously do. You, I am so inspired by what you are doing. And that's why I had to get your book right away. And I'm just like, it's just to me, it's amazing. And so I, I want to know what your, what's your secret? What's, what do you do? Well, it, it's so funny that you asked that question because um, one of the chapters in the book, it's about, and I know you haven't gotten through it all yet, but there's a portion of the book that's about uh, dismantling this uh, construct of perfectionism and letting it go because it holds us back, you know, thinking that everything we have to do is perfect. And when we make a mistake, we ruminate and ruminate. And I actually talk about how people ask me this question when I'm, when I'm telling people, you got to get over this. You, you can't just expect every, if you're, you're holding yourself accountable to a, a level of, of, uh, success that's not achievable by definition because nobody's perfect and they ask me that question so you do this and you do this how do you do that all and I'm like I don't it's not it's nowhere near what it looks like but you know it's there's it's, you just kind of like get used to like it's not all going to be perfect and you you kind of enjoy the the bumpy ride of it all and you just try to get more right than you get wrong and it's it is part of it I think is that we hold ourselves accountable to such a high level mm -hmm. um, that no one could do anything at that level yeah so you know I I when I started the book it it it, it's not perfect. <laughs> it's you know and and I had to work through that process and find a way to do it and and I'm also in all of these cases, even with Build-A-Bear, you know, there's ups and there's downs. And even with my family, my, when my kids were younger, they're older now. Um, but, uh, you know, I did a lot of things that weren't great. Like they had the wrong clothes for school or didn't, you know, pack their lunches and nothing mm -hmm. wasn't perfect, but we found a way. And I think as long as you're trying to do, you know, the best you can do and you're doing it with love and your heart in the right place, um, and that you know going in that it's not going to be perfect, but you're going to keep working at it. And that you're always working from a core impact of passion, then it somehow all works out. And I'm, I'm going to speak of that in that last commentary, the book, people are like, why would you take on this? And it's like, because I wasn't taking it on. There was an internal burning for me, this book was going to come out, right? Yeah. And that's when you're, you know, you get yourself aligned with who are you? What do you want to achieve in life? What kind of goals have you set for yourself? And this was, this was a part of something that was inspired for me. So then it's not like, it's not like, oh, no, I got to go home and write another chapter of the book. Work. It was, it was coming out. 
Um, whether it was going to be published or not was a whole different question. <laughs> but, but some of this stuff needed to come out and I was inspired to do it, um, mostly because a lot of other women and, and young business people and folks had gone, we got to share some of this. It would be so helpful. Mm -hmm. So I was inspired to see other people kind of maybe not hold themselves to such a high bar yeah. that they can't achieve their goals. I, I completely agree. I think, I mean, I think any, everyone can do this with women in particular. And when you say about sort of that perfectionist, but also just that if you can't do it well or right, or if you have that, then you're not going to just put it out there. Like you, like you said, you just had that passion to write and to do that, but you also didn't have the expectations. Like if you go in there thinking, oh, this is going to be bad or whatever, but who cares? Like, I think we need to, sometimes we can sabotage ourselves by putting those thoughts in our head. I think we do that more than um, is healthy and certainly more than we care to believe. And I think that those thoughts in your head that kind of get in an argument with yourself, mm -hmm. it's so easy to find the one reason why you shouldn't do it, that you forget the hundred reasons why you should. And often that one reason, it's nowhere near as scary as your making it out to be and that's what keeps you so many times from just taking the first step of achieving a goal or even trying a goal and if you can just embrace well did you really expect it to be perfect the first time you tried mm -hmm. well again a ridiculous bar yeah a bar so high that you sometimes talk yourself out of even giving it a shot and, you know, that's, you can ask anyone those stories. I mean, I talk about in the book as well, lots of, there's, there's not anyone who's ever done anything successful, whether it's an inventor or an athlete or, you know, just go a business person. There's a whole lot of trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing before you get to the trying and doing. Yeah. Um, just part of the process. Don't get so hung up on it. Well, I think that one thing, it's like, it's one thing to try something new when you're just starting out or to go into something, which I want to get to. But um, when you already have this success, like you do as this marketer, as CEO, and then you put yourself, anyone who, when they want to start doing something else that's maybe out of their wheelhouse or out of their, just what their success is about, whether it be, you know, an author or an executive producer, I think that's more daunting. Like that's where you say, I don't want to, it's vulnerable to say, okay, what if I fail at this when I'm so good here? And then all of a sudden it's going to wipe out all of my successes. I don't, I mean, again, we are, what we put in our mind is ridiculous, but I think this is something that people go through. Yeah, absolutely. And in this particular case though, like I can't say that I had sat down and written a goal that I wanted to become an executive producer of, you know, of a movie. Um, this was based in the strategy of Build-A-Bear expanding and evolving and that our, our value, so much of our value lies in the brand itself and the extension of the brand and pivoting from a retailer that created this, you know, powerful, iconic uh, experience that creates all these emotional connections with people on becoming an intellectual property company that just happens to have vertical retail called Build-A-Bear where you go in and, and make these wonderful, you know, teddy bears that you mm -hmm. keep alive. But part of that was the extension into entertainment because we sold 225 million bears. And for us, those aren't just products. You know, those are 225 million stories that people share. So we're storytellers at heart. So we started this evolution and discussion on Build-A-Bear should be in the entertainment business. And that's not a huge leap. I mean, a lot of toy companies have done that. There's a whole lot of news about that right now, in fact. And um, so those were that's where that came from and it turned out that the the catalyst to get that done was for me to be executive producer <laughs> i was like i'll figure it out i okay. mean and sure, then, another but, thing to add to your leader another, your, yeah, another happy on top of that you know having come from the marketing side uh particularly as the head of product uh or excuse me the head of the toy division at hasbro i had you know, you don't really call it this but in a sense, executive produced hundreds of commercials in my lifetime. So it's, you know, lots of little 30 second and 15 second movies. There's an awful lot that's the same. So I ended up, you know, learning a lot, but also again, which is might be surprising to people, 
figuring out that you probably knew more than you thought you did. Yeah. But right. just got to lean in sometimes. Yeah, no, I, and, and I do. I think people sometimes pigeonhole themselves and say, okay, I haven't done that. But if you really look at the skill set that it takes to be a successful executive producer to producing the spots that you did, there's so many that cross over. And I think that, you know, we tend to not necessarily give ourselves that credit sometimes. So, so many times of elevating um, and, and assessing the experiences that you've had and understanding how transferable they are, mm -hmm. that you're not pigeonholed. In fact, you may be narrowing your own scope by not stopping and pausing and trying to separate yourself from what you do every day and looking at yourself and your experience and your background objectively. In fact, that would be a, maybe I'll put that in the next book. That would be a really great exercise for people. If you just, without defining the company or the exact products or the this or the that, and tried to define yourself as skill sets, and then look at those skill sets as where else they could be of benefit, you might think of yourself as an entirely different person. Yeah, no, and it opened up so many more opportunities for you. I agree. Well, I want to get into when you first started. So when you were first setting those goals for yourself, when you were graduating college, and I mean, I know you started on the agency side for a short time, but then went to Mattel, Hasbro, but then you went to Stride, right? And then now finally at um, Build-A-Bear. So what were you envisioning, you know, when you were, you know, getting ready to graduate college, did you see this? Did you aspire for what you're doing now? Or maybe did it take a couple of twists and turns there? Oh, I couldn't have ever, I'm not that big of a thinker. <laughs> <laughs> particularly my yes. <laughs> I don't know. I will tell you that I had already drawn out a logo for my own ad agency really that yeah um that I thought that would be really cool so maybe I there was deep down in there I thought I would run a company someday but certainly not at the scale of this yeah um and and I never thought that I would uh, step this far away from my creative roots, even though this is still a very creative company, I don't spend the majority of my time yes. <laughs> and designing and executive producing. Mm -hmm. I spend the majority of my time managing the business side of what we do um, and the investor side uh, of what we do. Um, and so that's, that's a new world for me that I never would have, have thought of. Um, so no, I can't say that I did, but I, I think that this combination, this balance of holding on somewhat to what drove me, drove my heart, which was creative and kid centric things. And even in the advertising, advertising space, I was on the confection side for most of my career, coming at it with a usefulness. Um, and then that helped guide me on the kinds of things that I thought were just for no better word, fun, um, which was then really just a word that meant inspiring, you know, love what you do, love what you do. You hear that all the time. It's the truth. Why wouldn't you choose a path if you have the wherewithal yep. to love yep. what you do? And you might be surprised what comes of that because you don't think of it as work, which sounds bad. Um, you think of it as, oh my gosh, this is exciting. I get up, I get to get up in the morning and, you know, make more Barbie fashions. <laughs> like, that's like, yeah. that's great. I mean, or, you know, go to a snickers shoot. I mean, this stuff is fun. I mean, literally had so much fun in my career. Now there's stuff that comes along with that that isn't fun, but what if it was all not fun? I mean, you, how inspired are you to, to lean in when you don't look forward to it? And that's more important than I think people recognize. And when I graduated from business school, the choice that I made was a lot less lucrative, a lot less lucrative than some of my other uh, uh, friends and uh, classmates made. Um, I did not go into investment banking and become a financial analyst or go into venture capitalism or a big management consulting firm. I literally paid for following my heart yeah. um but 
I think at the end of the day, and they probably followed their heart too. This isn't a judgment of this no, I, another. They were following their heart. Um, that by doing that, it actually led to success. Um, and as you're doing this, you're accumulating back to this point, great opening point, these skill sets that you don't realize that you're accumulating and you never know when they're going to come in handy. In fact, so much of what I learned at Columbia Business School really didn't kick in at its highest level until I was sitting in a CEO role a little bit when I was the president of a division, but I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> and I went back and reviewed some things like, I know how to do this. I've never had to use this, but I know how to do this. You know, you just, you never know. And just keep expanding, keep being willing to learn. And at the same time, the balancing of, is that Jasmine? Am I excited about that? Now, trust me, you know this. Anyone who's done anything, again, knows this. There's going to be times in there where there's these rough patches where you're like, I just got to nose down and work, th work through this. But even in those moments when there is a bigger vision with a bigger goal and you understand that's a means to an end, it's not drudgery. Mm -hmm. It's just another stepping stone. Yeah. Well, and I also agree with the, you know, when you're saying that you have to have that passion or love or whatever it is, because I think that makes you then throw yourself to into it more as opposed to just you know, doing my nine to five, you know, and then you leave. It's, you put more of yourself into it, which ultimately is going to make you more successful. You know, it's going to make you go up the ladder or, and I know you don't like to call it a ladder. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a ladder. Uh, I learned that from the book. And so, but, um, but just, it's going to make you advance more by taking on everything you can, even if it's not part of your job description, because then that brings you to the next, which I want to jump into then becoming CEO, as you mentioned, that's not going to have all that creative anymore. How do you, because you don't want to not go there because of course that brings you to another level and another opportunity. But at the same point, how do you align that with finding that creativity? Is that through your book? Is that through the executive producing? Like, because I think some people maybe stop their career at a point because they don't want to lose whatever it is they're doing. And then that can hinder them as well moving forward. That's also a fantastic thing to explore. Um, I solved for that by really focusing on opportunities at companies that had a, were more creative than not. So by definition, a part of my job is how does this show up at retail? What do the products look like? What are the big ideas? How do we market this? That is That does touch my world. I'm not separated from that because we are creative at heart and it's such a big part of how we generate revenue. Um, and in an environment like that, you, you do, you put your best minds on that, whether that's me or someone else. But because of this rich experience in toys and product development, I came up that side of the, of the equation, inclusive of, again, uh, marketing. You know, there's, there's insight and counsel and, and it's really still quite fun. And I have a tremendous relationship with that portion of the organization where when we're trying to solve a, a question or, or, or want to take next, go next level or, do an exploratory, they know when I'm walking in, we're leaving titles at the door. We're really going to talk like creatives, like we're pulling out pens and pencils and we're working our way through this. And that's really, it jazzes me. And I'm not there to win, you know, I'm not there to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. We're there to really brainstorm through this uh, and try to solve, you know, the problem or create a new opportunity for the company. And I find that incredibly energizing. And I'm so glad to have a team that I can do that with. But yeah, you got to know what drives you um, and make sure you don't come. If, you, if you're in a position where that is totally isolated from who you are, you've got to solve for that in a different way, I think. Or it'll slowly like shut you down um, if that's where your energy comes from. But that's the part of you knowing you. Like where does your energy come from? 
what does in, you know, create that impassioned drive for you? What is your inspiration? And make sure you're gifting yourself with that opportunity. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think if you don't keep that part of it, then like you said, you're just going to lose any passion or you know anything that you want to really strive forward to strive and to make things better you're just going to not phone it in but in a sense just you know say okay let's just keep it status quo and I think once you do that especially in a position like yourself but in any position I think you're not as valuable to any corporation or any any uh, organization so uh, right and the big downside that I've seen uh, from people as well is when you make that decision and you don't find the outlet for your passion, whether it's at your job or in another another aspect of your life, um, oftentimes uh, it starts, you start to, whether consciously or unconsciously, build a little bit of resentment around the job that you are choosing to do, which only gets you in a downward spiral. You're, you know, at the end of the day, if de depending on how you define success, there's really no one that I know that inclusive of that, when they really think about it, isn't some element of happiness. Yep. So what what is success if it doesn't include being happy? Um, and it's hard to be happy when you're full of uh, blame, it, resentfulness, and, and yeah, maybe <laughs> anger about decisions that you've made. Yeah. So, you know, you stay balanced, stay and try to keep a little joy in your life. There's nothing and the, again, there's nothing wrong with these inner interim moments where you're like, oh, I've got to grind this out, but it's got to be to a greater end. Uh, so you can find at least interim passion to move yourself through that to get to another goal. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, I want to we made mention of your book, Stories and Heart. And um, I want to, this basically the, just for people, anyone who doesn't know, um, it's how personal, how personal stories can shape your success, both personally and professionally. So um, one of it, you have sort of these workshops um, or worksheets that people to fill out and to help them sort of find those, uh, those moments in their life and shape that kind of success. And well, I want to sort of turn the tables on you and do my version of your <laughs> a few of your questions. So um, one of the questions you guys you ask is personal blind spot. So but I want to talk about what do you think was your personal blind spot when you were younger? Like what was it maybe that sort of I don't know hindered you or whatever it could have done. Okay, so this is a tough one because nobody believes me when I say it. Um, that I, I, like everyone else, I struggle with, you know, self-confidence. Um, and I just may have created a whole lot of tools, um, that have helped me overcome that through the years. Um, and the, you know, being willing to try things that are out of my wheelhouse and, you know, there's, and particularly you said it when you're good at something else. There's also people in your life who are like, well, you're so good at this. Why even bother? Why, why do that? Or, you know, and if people like to, it's handy for people to stick you in a box. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whether it's because I'm a woman or I'm Southern or I'm blonde or I'm, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the reasons are, but, you know, so I had to dig a you know, lot of bootstrapping in some circumstances uh, to get the self-confidence to do big things. Um, and people look at that again and they're like, but you did. So clearly you did have self-confidence, but I, there's a lot of tools, a lot of self-talk, um, and a lot of internal work to get to that point. There's an entire, uh, discussion in the book about when I decided to, uh, apply to business school, that was an entire, what, what, somebody might call it thing like I, I did the whole I filled out the entire uh application and, and still I, I still didn't turn it in for weeks like I was I, I was scared to death that I'm like I'm gonna this isn't gonna work out I'm gonna have to deal with the disappointment of this um it was the last day of the last round uh that I had that hand walked up to the applications office 
Uh, and, and, and again, kind of this, you know, I've done this presentation in front of a lot of people. And then when I tell that story, there's this seems to be this assumption that I did that because I was just so confident that I was almost arrogant, right? The truth is upon kind of self-reflection of that, I would tell you that it's much, much more likely that I did that. So I would have a really good excuse for not getting in yeah. that I could, that I could weave around, you know, this, well, you know, of course I didn't get in because, you know, I waited to the last day. I mean, what do you expect? You know, yeah. that makes perfect sense. I mean, I, you know, whatever, Give you but what a cop out, you know, and then I had to face this reality that I'd gotten into business school and I didn't have the means to pay for it. I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> so you got this whole different level of confidence that you've got to like dig up. Like, am I going to be able to operate in this environment? And again, of course it was fine. And then, so what's your blind spot? Well, I look back on my life and there's so many times, how many times do I have to put myself in that situation where I think it's going to be impossible and I just leap out mm -hmm. and it's fine. And at some juncture, you have to get to a place where you're like, well, what have you not done? Because you keep defining yourself, you're defining yourself um, by limitations. Yeah. What, at what point are you gonna go just dang it and leap so far and so high that you finally do hit the wall. Well, you know what? I'm 59 years old. I need to find it because there's also this whole thing in there about when, when you're setting goals and I don't achieve all my goals, by the way, but when you're setting goals and you, they're all easily achieved, you got to look at yourself. Are you setting them high enough? Are you setting them high enough? Yeah. No, so that's kind of a blind spot. I think that's definitely, and I think it's one a lot of people, I think the difference is, which um, I don't think it needs to be pointed out, but in terms of for you is you still did it. You know, I'm not, maybe there are ones that there are those missed opportunities, but I think for many people, they don't necessarily still do it. And I think that's why- You don't know what I have not done. Right, but that's what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm not assuming you haven't not done certain things. You know, you might've been, you know, the Pope or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we would have been running for president. But um, all I'm saying is, the, it's those choices that you, it's it's about the choice. What do they say? It's not bravery isn't not being afraid. It's being afraid and still doing it. it anyway. That's exactly what it is. No, that's what I'm saying. I think that for anyone listening to just take that in their head, that's like such an amazing thing to learn is even though you're afraid, even though you think you'll fail, just do it anyway. Because the worst that can happen is you're the same as where you are today. Like it, this, you know, that's exactly. really there's yeah. an entire chapter based on what's the worst thing that can happen. And these crazy things that we you know, literally concoct that's not even anywhere near what's likely going to happen if you were really weighing the odds. And you know, a lot of we a lot of the the growth in our life when we become smart is when we think we're really weighing everything and we're thinking about the downside appropriately well it's all of that knowledge that sometimes keeps us from actually taking a leap that we probably should it's yep. why a lot of success comes to people in their youth because they don't realize that the odds are against them to be successful well what would we do if we would stop weighing all the odds all the time mm -hmm. because the truth is somebody's going to win. And the question is, why not you? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Well, and getting into that whole, another question of yours, which we you sort of touched on in terms of yours is redefined failure or a worksheet. Yeah. It's not really a question necessarily. And I know what you mean by it. You mean maybe that's, you know, look at it a different way and maybe it wasn't failure. It was this, but I want to ask you, was there a time in your career that you really saw yourself that it was failure that you failed at something and how did it impact you and then how were you able to then move on from that there's a whole lot of them <laughs> it's yeah of course and uh, there's a book called uh i mean it's a chapter in the book about um a, an entrepreneurial endeavor that was an abject failure failure it just we sold in a a a product line uh, called Dom Dolls um, to Toys R Us 
um, had all of this, you know, early success with it, did a collectible doll. It was a, re, a, a remake of a, a doll that had its 30th anniversary. I bought the brand um, and we sold it in for the holiday season, had it in the containers coming from China. And, um, you know, unfortunately that happened to be the same fall as uh, nine, the 9-11 disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of orders across the globe, across categories were just canceled. Um, but when you're sitting with a, and, you know, and I, I always preface this discussion with, there were so many more things that were happened on that day and repercussions in people's lives that were crushed in ways that this is pales in comparison. So I'm not trying to make it more than it is, but there's an issue. I've got a container load of product that I've a lot of sweat equity and a whole lot of my savings sitting on the water in the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, what am I going to do with that? I was just, you know, I'm have a little bitty baby at home and I'm pregnant with my second child. And it's, you know, I, we, this was tough. And um, it's how to, how to lift yourself up out of that. You know, we figured out a way to solve for some of the financial challenges, but it really, caused me to question my capabilities as a business person, as a toy person, as a, I mean, just across the board, like I should just go hide under a rock somewhere, you know, like I shouldn't get back in the toy industry. Well, I know, I mean, literally it, it was just a complete no-go. Um, and it was in that moment that I started to try to create a construct around this redefine, redefining of failure. Um, but even in that moment, a lot of that was just plain bootstrapping. And it took me a little while to get on the other side of it to start to see the thing that the famous Steve Jobs quote he talks about how you, you just can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can connect them looking backwards. How when so many of those dots for him, inclusive of being ousted from his own company, you know, uh, famously to then um, return and be successful again. Um, that you go, wow, if that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened, and this wouldn't have happened, and this wouldn't have happened that created this. So if that's the case, with so many wise people and so many things, can we not imagine that as a possibility in the moment, that we don't know everything about the why? So why define it as failure before you know what its actual definition is? Just define it as something that happened, which was unexpected in the moment that you're currently wanting to label as bad, but the truth is you don't know. Just that alone changes everything about the way you look at it. Then if you can do that, say, I really don't know if this is bad or good for in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, that's the honest truth. You don't know. You don't know what role this is going to play in your life. Here's the one thing I do know. How you think about that moment will define whether it's good or bad in your life. Yeah. And how you respond to it. Exactly. So back to the subtitle of the book, of Unlock the Power of Personal Story to Create a Life You Love. All I'm asking you to do, and those are re that's a really heady is in the worst of examples like that, if you can learn to pause and say, look, this just happened. I, maybe I could have done this differently. Maybe I could have done that. Maybe everything that I would have done exactly the same, but things still happen. That's just the case. Things still happen. If you can pause and at least wrap around, do your very best to wrap a story that's more empowering than disempowering about that, even if it's just neutral, it is miraculous what it can do for your mindset about what to do next and what you're capable of doing next. Those are life-changing situations, but this is true with the everyday. Maybe you go in in the morning, something doesn't happen right, or maybe somebody cuts you off in traffic. We wrap the crazy stuff around those reasons why well, there probably really isn't any meaning at all around any of that. Just think about how empowering that is by having that single mindset set shift yep. and what that can do for your life. Yep. No, I completely agree. I think that's a really smart way to look at it. Um, I want to ask you, because we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to ask you, 
what is it that's one thing that most people get wrong about you? And we talked a little bit about that you're very confident. So let's not go there. But no, just, I think I'm really confident. And I'm often not. <laughs> but, um, it takes but, a lot of work. It, I don't think people realize the daily work that it takes to stay centered and balanced, that you've got to, you've got to be dedicated to creating a powerful relationship with you. That's an everyday thing. I think that people often, it's very easy to want to look at what I have or haven't done or who I am or who I'm not or what I do, that all of that's just so easy. And I'm not going to pretend that it's harder than, but all of that is because of, I work really hard at creating a, the best relationship I can with knowing who I am, staying dedicated to the big picture giving people benefit of the doubt like there these are these are daily processes um and there's a, also a part part of the book that it's the the daily little steps that kind of discipline are some of the hardest things that y y you do in life not the big goal or this big thing was achieved or that was achieved it's it's that everyday um discipline of making sure you tell your kids you, you love them and taking that moment for yourself and saying, all right, I'm going to get centered about this and how that just accumulates over time to where it becomes a little more a, ha a habit. Then that habit rolls into the habit of success. It's like, there's a lot that goes into that. It's, it's just rarely this big moment in time and I set this big goal and I did this thing and it's just not like that. Um, and I think that, that people don't, I, I'll, I'll go one step further and say that it's just like with all this baggage we carry around with us and we want to hold on to that baggage because it's easier if we have the baggage and we define ourselves with limitations that we then have an excuse to not really go for goals. I think that it's easier to look at people who far beyond me that are super successful and say, Oh, that was just so easy for them. Oh, that was meant to be for them because it gives you an excuse to not have to take that hard journey as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Is, is there a something you do in your personal life that maybe helps get you more grounded or, um, you know, takes that time to, okay, you need to rethink what's happening or whatever maybe you forget about everything like that thing that you need to take away to sort of find that self of you everyone needs to find their own path to that i have a couple of tools i love to get up in the morning and walk um and i don't use that time to walk and i'm on the phone with somebody and trying to also look through my calendar at the same time I'm trying to get grounded from an appreciation perspective, you know, just like I, there's this little loop de loop in my neighborhood and I do it almost every morning um, and um, just breathe and look at, you notice the weather, notice the trees, notice what's happening. Uh, and that sets the stage for my day. Um, I also have a good process of I do write down my goals and, and look at them and respond, you know, kind of refine. Um, I'm not tied to them to a place where I, if I don't achieve this or that, that I then spend the next six months beating myself up about it because <laughs> that's kind of antithesis of the whole right, right. Of the process, right? <laughs> but, but sometimes if you get some stuff that's a little bit further out there, maybe some big dreams in the three and five years, and sometimes they're not even big dreams where I got to do this or this, but it's things about, I want to make sure that, you know, we get, we fit the family vacation in because time gets away from you. Like just stuff like that, like get that done. Um, do one little thing toward a goal and you don't do it. If you don't just kind of think a little bit further out, you get caught up so much in the everyday life passes you right by. And um, I hope we all are able to create a tremendous roadmap to happiness that's inclusive of a lot of precious memories. And sometimes we have to create that environment 
um, purposefully to assure that the, that those memories are there. Yep, I agree. And get and just get out of our way, <laughs> you know, like make that uh, happen for you. But uh, that, Sharon, honestly, like I said, this is truly a pleasure. I was so excited for this. So I'm so grateful for you to take the time of your busy schedule <laughs> to talk with me. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. And um, as I always say, uh, if you know a woman marketer who you would love to hear more about, um, please let me know, give me the suggestions and I will do my best to get them. So thank you for watching. And again, thanks so much, Sharon.